you will know that we are live because I will start talking once it goes up. Hi, everyone. I think every, a lot of people watching have been following what's been happening in Gaza, um, that the Israeli military has been shooting live ammunition and caused the death of at least 17 people and over 1,400 um, injured, over 750 of them uh, by live fire. Uh, that was last weekend, and uh, we're expecting another protest uh, tomorrow. So we are here with uh, Ahmed and Rana from the project We Are Not Numbers. And, um, sorry. Uh, and they're in Gaza currently. Um, they are writers who live in Gaza and both of them last weekend were at the Great Return March. Can each of you tell us a little bit about yourselves and a little bit about the, the We Are Not Numbers project? Ahmed, if we can start with you. Yeah, yeah. hello. Uh, my name is Ahmed Anahou. Um, I'm 24 years old. I uh, graduated from Las University from English and Information, and I'm now project manager of We Are Not Numbers. I'm also a freelance journalist. Well, We Are Not Numbers is a storytelling project that aims to amplify the voices of youth uh, of the Palestinian youth living in, uh, in Palestine and diaspora. And um, actually the idea of the We Are Not Number project started after the last Israeli war in Gaza when the media only focused on the numbers uh, of the people killed and injured in Gaza, the numbers of houses they moved, but they never like uh, told the stories behind these numbers in the news. Um, so we are not numbers started to uh, amplify the voices and the human stories uh, behind these numbers. Uh, the idea that um, and how we work is that we there are writers, budding writers from the Gaza Strip with, with international mentors and authors. Um, so they could tell these stories in um, a very professional, proper way. We started um, after uh, 2014, like we launched the project in 2015 with uh, 20 writers from Gaza and another 20 mentors and authors, established authors and journalists around the world. But now we have expanded and we, um, we are recruiting writers from um, the whole Gaza Strip, the West Bank, uh, Jerusalem, Lebanon, and uh, other Palestinians, um, uh, refugees uh, around the world. Um, and that's uh, about We Are Not Numbers. Rana, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, hi there. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting us uh, to talk to the people today. Uh, my name is Rana Shber. I'm a writer and an author, a first time author. I'm a writer at We Are Not Numbers. Uh, this is my passion actually, but my daily job is an English language trainer and trans translator. And I also work as an IELTS examiner at British Council. And I'm a mother of three. Uh, set, one set of triplets, two girls and one boy. Thank you so much. Um, both of you were at the Great Return March in Gaza last weekend. Can you tell us what inspired you to go to the march um, and then what it was like? Uh, Rana first and then Ahmed? Um, okay, so um, last Friday, um, uh, throughout the last week, there were calls, you know, for everyone that there's going to be the great march of return, and um, all the families were preparing to go, and, um, you know, you could just feel the atmosphere, there was excitement in the air, and I told my children that we're going to go and, you know, see our country, um, so... Uh, uh, we went there, and um, it took us, uh, the, the streets were very crowded. It took us about an hour to get there. Um, when I got there, actually, I was very surprised. I felt like all of, all of Gaza was there. There were just, you know, tents everywhere and families sitting together on the ground with their kids, uh, fathers, mothers, children. And um, my children, um, this was the first time in their life to actually get a glimpse of 
Palestine, even though it's just a borderline area. And uh, I think that everyone there felt that it was a national duty for us to go there and, and you know, and um, raise our voices and uh, be peaceful in doing that. So um, it was real. I felt that there was everyone was inspired um, to go because they felt that this is a national duty for all of us. Ahmed, could you uh, tell us yourself? Okay, actually, um, um, as Rana elaborated, um, the whole Gaza Strip was anxious about uh, was anxious and um, anticipated for this March of Return because they have been. Uh, the organizers have been uh, promoting for this um, uh, protest for a long time. And actually, it started on Friday, and I really wanted to go on Friday because I felt it's a national and a moral duty to participate in this uh, protest and uh, be with my people who are fed up with the oppression, uh, with the oppression they are being under. Uh, I couldn't go on Friday because my mother was diagnosed with cancer and she needed lots of um, caring and help. But the rest of my family went there and uh, my father and my brothers went on uh, Friday. Um, when they came back actually and told me what they saw, yeah. Oh, please go on. Yeah, so when, uh, when they told me what they saw and what they, uh, uh, what have been there, I was so irritated. I wanted to so bad to go. So I went on the second day, on Saturday. And actually, um, on on one uh, on Friday, there were thousands, like uh, a quarter million people participated in the uh, in the protest on Friday. But on Saturday, the number of people like listened because you know so many people had like jobs and uh, things to do on the uh, other uh, days. Uh, so I went there. I went to a um like close to Nahal Oz border. And um, when I went there, I found that also there are hundreds of people participating in the, in the protest. There was like um, uh, an area between the border and between the first row of the, um, of the uh, houses of al Shajaiya, And it was really, really um, awkward and weird and sad and funny at the same time that people, whole families participated in the protest, not only youth from Gaza, but whole families like kids um, uh, little people, girls, boys, families, houses, spouses, everyone in the society participate in this protest because they want they are fed up with the oppression that they have been under. To and at the at the first of the uh, the protest, I saw that uh, there is an ambulance and nurses trying to save a life of an injured Palestinian, and among them were um, lots of, of cars and vans trying to sell fruits and juice uh, to the participants. A close, I, I have to be honest that I got really close to the border. I was in the first line uh, with, the, with these uh, youth shouting for freedom. And it was really sad that the Israelis meant and deliberately shot them in the knees. And among them, there were people who were trying to sell candies. So laughter and life and death were mixed and uh, joined at the same time in the uh, protest. And that was um, uh, sad and uh, special because you cannot see like these events happening um, in other place of the world. You cannot see like families gathered in circles, uh, sitting there taking selfies and among them and beside them there are people who are getting shot and injured. And it's so mixed. It is so lovely and sad actually. So uh, that's how I did. That's how I went and that's how I saw the events there. Ahmed, can you explain to us what the goals of the Great Return March are? Well, yeah. Well, first, um, I would like to emphasize that there, um, the the residents of the Gaza Strip, seventy percent of them are refugees, and they've been refugees for seventy years now, and they were so oppressed by the Israeli occupation. So, the organizers uh, of this um, march are unbiased; they are uh, unaffiliated with any. Palestinian uh, faction of party. Uh, they are original people. They said that it is enough for uh, the Palestinians to be refugees in their own lands. They wanted to, to go um, and say that we demand our rights. Actually, a protesting the, is a right guaranteed by the international law and by the UN. And the, the Palestinians were practicing one of their rights, which is protesting and peacefully. 
and they are demanding another right, which is the right of return. And that was issued by the uh, UN Resolution 194, uh, paragraph uh, three. So the Palestinians wanted to go and say that we do not want to be dependent on the UN and UNRWA. We want to go back to our homelands. We want to participate. We want to practice our uh, right of returning to our um, to our land. And actually, um, the the protest and the march of return started uh, was planned to uh, to last for six weeks, uh, starting from the Earth Day and the 13th the 13th of, um, of uh, March, and it will last to the 15th of May. Um, it, was, um, uh, it was prepared to be at the, um, at the um, located at, across the Gaza Strip of at least 700 meters away from the border. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's what I think um, the March of Britain is about. Is there uh, any question? Rana. Regarding the, um, yeah. Uh, well, Rana, I was wondering if you could talk to us about the dates that were chosen for the beginning and the end of the march, um, and what are the significance of those dates? Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to emphasize something Ahmed said, um, which is that the people behind uh, the people behind the march who organized the march are a national committee, which is comprised of all Palestinian factions. So it is not, um, it is, um, it, this contradicts with the Israeli propaganda that this is a Hamas-led um, uh, march. So, um, and if you go there, you will see that you will see people from different factions, different groups uh, across the Palestinian society. Um, so this committee had long been um, uh, preparing for this march. Uh, so there was a preparation phase, and then March 30th was the second phase uh, in which um, uh, in which the people started to camp in these uh, March. Uh, the significance of this date, of course, is that March 30th, um, 1976, was a Palestinian land day, and this um, day is commemorated every year by the Palestinians. Um, what happened was uh, that the Israeli occupation forces tried to confiscate um, land, uh, Palestinian land, um, 42 years ago, and the people there, the Palestinians, um, protested against their confiscation of their of their land, uh, because you know confiscation means more displacement, more displacement for people. So what happened was that the Israelis um, retaliated with violence and aggression, and they killed six Palestinians. So um, for us, we sell, we commemorate this day every year um, because uh, it's not just for notion or just to remember the past, but because um, it's a way of uh, also resistance uh, because confiscation of land has not stopped every month, every week. We see more settlements uh, built on Palestinian land uh, and more people are displaced. So this is the thing significance of the first day, which is March um, uh, 30th. Uh, the second day, uh, like Ahmed said, the protest is uh, the March protest is, uh, is uh, scheduled to continue till uh, May 15th. And of course, everybody knows that this is the day of the Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe. Um, which were uprooted from their land and they were um, evicted from their homes and displaced and they um, were scattered, you know, all over the world. Uh, many of them um, took refuge. They went, to, they traveled to Gaza. Many of them died on the way. They were, uh, I think anybody who studies the Nakba will um, read these horrible stories of people, you know, just um, uh, leaving their homes, uh, being evicted from their homes and taking... Uh, and, and going on foot to Gaza, of them died on the way from um, heat strokes, from disease. Uh, so this is a, 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 this is a day um, which, ironically, the Israelis, uh, you know, they celebrate as their Independence Day, but it is a, a catastrophe and Nakba Day. So the march is um, is going to continue till May 15th, and we hope that by the international community will have found and that we are able actually to break the siege and to uh, see our country uh, because this is something uh, is it's only it's only it's uh, it's only fair uh, 
you know, for these refugees to return to their land after 70 years. And this, this, um, this coming month, May 20, uh, 2018, marks the 70th anniversary of, of the Nakba. So yeah, these two dates have very important significance in Palestinian history. Rana, um, could you tell us how many people were participating in Gaza in the protest? And also, we understand that you are a mother uh, of triplets, in fact, and that you brought your children to the protest. Could you talk with us a yes. little bit, um, about that? Yes. Um, regarding numbers, I talked to um, one of the people um, in the National Committee this morning, and she told me that there was a, uh, um, 250,000 participants uh, participating in five different camps across Gaza Strip. Of course, all of them are located near the border, 700 meters. Uh, you know, initial number uh, which um, of the people who went last Friday. Uh, uh, as a mother, uh, I felt, I mean, I could not leave my kids at home and let them watch me on television. <laughs> uh, I think that um, there's a very sad uh, when it comes to Palestinian children here. Palestinian, to, 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 to my kids and other Palestinian kids, Palestine is something you see in school textbooks. And this is the sad reality which I have had to face as a mother. And I, I think I can speak for all the mothers. So um, for instance, in schools, they study national studies. And it's really uh, ironic, you know, they just see pictures of famous play Palestine in, in a textbook. So um, they would often come to me and say, uh, mom, where is this located? For example, uh, the Ibrahimi mosque, it's located in Hebron. So, I mean, to them, Hebron is as foreign as any other country they haven't been to because they just have to keep imagining Hebron, Jerusalem, these Palestinian cities, which they know nothing about. Um, I mean, tell me about a country uh, in, in today's world where its own citizens can go and visit visit their own country so um when i took them to the to the rally uh and they this was the first time that they saw just this is just a small glimpse of of what was behind the fence um and i asked them how do you feel this is this is our country it's behind this fence um uh, and i also asked um, a friend this morning actually uh, about taking her kids and she said that they had they asked her the same questions why do why don't we have beautiful trees like they do why there's so much space and uh, uh, I think that we have to um, educate our kids on um, country and how it was stolen from them so it's not uh, we can't detach them from their surroundings from this environment this is the environment they were forced to grow up and live in and I think that as parents and educators we have to tell them about their country and that one day we will return to Palestine. I wanted to ask you a bit about women participating in the march. Um, mm. I know that you were there but sometimes the images that we see coming out um, are just uh, groups of young men. And so I wanted to ask you um, how many women were there and how did it feel to, to be there as a woman? Um, well, I saw hundreds of women there. I mean, like uh, Ahmed and I said, there were uh, whole families. I mean, families sitting together, you know, father, mother, and children sitting together. Um, there were hundreds of women there, I think, they, maybe they um, just men or even more women, you know, they're more passionate about, you know, um, doing this, these kind of things. Um, actually, there were women doing different things there. Uh, some of them were um, them. Uh, some of them were actually cross stitching uh, Palestinian embroidery and uh, some of them were doing Debka with the with the men. Um, they were participating in every part and they were I saw some women, you know, t uh, children, you know, about the place we were in and about Palestine. And they, they walked towards, uh, you know, to the they walked down the path, which leads to the, but of course, they didn't get any close. Uh, some of them were Palestinian flag, and they were trying to just to get as close as they could to the border and just plant this flag in the ground. I can say that women, women all over um, the place in the protest. Uh, Ahmed, could you talk to us um, a bit about 
uh, those who were killed and injured, um, who they were and uh, what they were doing when they were injured. Yeah. And killed were uh, civilian people, civilian participants of the march. They were, some of them were kids, some of them were um, youth. They were participating peacefully. And I would not say about anything that the media say uh, I will tell you what I saw when I participated in the uh, in the protest. Actually, the um, uh, the youth and I, I actually have seen many many participants being shot in the in the protest. And they were actually a group um, like a, a few hundred people uh, gathering in the front line, like the closest part to the Israeli to the, the Israeli fence, and it was like two to three hundred meters away from the Israelis. And for the first time in my life, when I got there, I saw the soldiers, actually. And the Israeli soldiers were um, hid behind a, a, a sand hill. And they, only their skulls were appearing to the people. And they were uh, like uh, holding their um, rifles and their um, uh, sniper shooting uh, shooters. Actually, the, the participants and the youth have never posed any threat to the Israelis, you know, because whenever, like, you know, a couple of hundred of people participated and they were in the closest part to the fence, but none of them like hold a, a, a gun or a stone or a Molotov or anything at all. They were peaceful and they were rising the Palestinian flags and they were shouting for freedom and the right of return. But actually, and uh, personally, I think that the Israeli snipers were like practicing their passion of shooting the Palestinians, you know, because when they, they are snipers and they were killing the Palestinians for fun. And actually, I saw some of the injuries. The, the, the Israelis deliberately uh, were, were shooting at the knees of the Palestinians. And I have a friend in Dir al-Bala who, uh, who was a football player. And he was, um, he was like a couple hundred meters away from the Israelis. And they shot him in both his legs. And that ended his career and his life, actually. The Israelis were provocative because they uh, distributed snipers on the fence uh, uh, and they actually prepared to kill the Palestinians. And um, actually, and so far as we speak today, two Palestinians were killed. Like now the number of the Palestinians were um, are um, 20 killed and more than 105,000 Palestinians injured. And I was wondering why would the Israelis uh, confront Palestinian civilians uh, protesting with rifles and snipers. Um, uh, how how would that happen actually in any civilized country? Um, uh, okay, that's um, and actually some of the Palestinians who participated were not youth. Uh, most of them were actually families. Some of them were um, my kids. Some of them were uh, women. And let's let's like. Um, Let's imagine that the participants were throwing stones. Actually, to be honest, I saw in the whole protest, I saw only two people, two young people throwing stones at the Israeli soldiers. And that's right, only two among thousands of people were throwing stones. But these stones could never, ever, ever reach Israelis. It's like too far away from the Israelis and the Israelis and the Israeli soldiers were hidden behind a hill. So, they could never pose a threat. Even if they throw stones, they could never reach the soldiers. Could you talk a little bit about the weapons that the soldiers were using? As you said, the stones could never reach the soldiers and those throwing them pose no, no threat to the Israeli military, um, but the military on the other hand, uh, could you talk a bit about their weapons? Run out of me. Uh, go ahead. Okay, I think that um, the Israelis used many kinds of weapons against the Palestinians. They used um, live ammunition, which uh, resulted in so many severe injuries. Like uh, there is uh, a report by the Ministry of Health today that, um, okay, beside the 20 people killed, there are uh, hundreds of people severely injured. And day by day, some of them are being, uh, uh, some of them die actually at the hospitals because the the kind of weapons that were used against them were, was like uh, life ammunition. Um, uh, some uh, they, the Israelis also used a drone to uh, drones, and they actually um, throw at the Palestinians tear gas and tear bombs. So for Israelis, all kind of weapons are uh, prohibited against the Palestinians, against the civilian Palestinians. But the Palestinians were not allowed even to uh, to throw stones at the Israelis. 
Rana, you, we spoke before about you bringing your children there. And as we were just hearing about these horrific weapons, um, could you talk about any fears that you had uh, bringing your children there and also about um, the hopes and dreams that, that you have for, for your children um, and how that feels growing up um, in under siege? Um, well, uh, I just want to add something about the weapons that were used that today, the early morning, um, uh, uh, a Palestinian um, young man was killed using uh, uh, by a drone missile. And this is the first time throughout the week of protest that this happens. So it is clear that these soldiers are receiving orders from, from their top officials to use maximum force, which, I mean, it's really hard to just understand how, um, you know, all the, these soldiers who are so fortified and protected behind their gear and the, the, the mountains of sand they're standing behind, how they um, would just attack uh, peaceful and vulnerable protesters this way. So the Ministry of Health um, uh, also issued a statement saying that they, uh, they use these kind, new kind of uh, bullets which actually um, penetrate and explode inside the body. And you might have seen images um, on social networks of how these, uh, the victims, how they sustain these injuries where you just have this big gap or big hole in their, in their legs and wherever they were targeted. And all of this is against international law and these are internationally banned weapons. So, I mean, and this is something, it's not new to us. I mean, in 2008, the, the 2008 um, aggression on Gaza, the Israelis used white phosphorus, they used dime. Um, so uh, Gaza to them is like a laboratory where they experiment their new uh, uh, weapons. And, and, and yet we have never seen them, you know, being prosecuted. And um, we have had, uh, you know, even doctors from outside come to Gaza and, you know, witness uh, these, um, these events. So uh, when I went to the to the protest, I mean, I, I mean, I don't like to feel that I'm different from other mothers. Every mother fears for her children, but I was very careful not to take my children too close to the border. Um, I just wanted them to see, you know, the scene, what it was like, and they they saw the Israeli soldiers from far, and they saw the, their vehicles, and they just got, you know. Uh, got a glimpse of what the whole situation was like. So uh, as a mother, I would never endanger my children and take them down to the fence, for example. Um, and neither would any mother, I think, here in Gaza. We love our children like any mother in the world. Uh, what I hope for the children of Palestine is that they just um, get a chance to live childhood. Um, if you come to Gaza, you will see that Palestinian children are not like um, any other children around the world. Their, their environment is infused with so many things that no other children um, see or even hear of. So for example, if you ask any child here, even if he's six years old, he'll tell you what kind of plane is, in the, is what kind of war plane is in the sky. Um, like if it's an F-16 or if it's an Apache, if it's a drone, you know, they have all this war terminology in their heads. Uh, it's not something that we teach them, but it's something that they acquire from this environment that they live in. And we can't help it. We can't detach our kids from this environment. Um, if you're walking down the street, you will see pictures of martyrs everywhere. So they will ask you, Mom, who is this on the wall? So you have to answer them. This is someone who was killed. Why was he killed? So you have to tell them the story. Um, I also found myself having to teach my children about Palestinian prisoners at an early age because it was something also in their um, Arabic language textbook. Um, there was a story about a Palestinian prisoner who was released from prison. It was actually a very short lesson. So my, actually my son came home to me and he said, mom, why was she, um, um, why was she in prison? Did she steal something? So this is, I mean, they are pure uh, innocent children, but you know, they, they are forced to live a phase that um, is, has nothing to do with childhood. So uh, I, I, my hopes and dreams for my kids and for all the kids in Palestine to wake up to the sound of birds, not bombs. Um, and if they have to wake up in the middle of the night, I don't want them to wake up to a sound of an airplane or an F-16. If, I'd rather have them wake up to the sound of a cricket. Um, I just want them to, you know, um, uh, live the normal phase of childhood. And I think that's something every child in the world deserves. Yesterday was Palestinian uh, Children's Day. 
And uh, it's really ironic because, um, you know, uh, it comes at a time when uh, the Israeli occupation forces, um, they uh, imprison children now and they sentence them to long months in prison. So Ahd al-Tamimi, uh, Ahmed al-Manasra, these are all kids. Uh, they are, these are just some of the names. Uh, any kid, even as young as three years old, can be snatched off the street and put in prison. I mean, sometimes I feel that we're living in a jungle. Where is international law? So uh, uh, kids are, um, uh, they get, um, they are facing the same things that grown up, grown ups face. So they grow up to be different people. So it is no wonder that, you know, our children here in Palestine are different from children all over the world. And it's not our fault, but this is how it is. And I hope for freedom for your children. That it may Thank you. I have Nada here with me. She wants to say something. Come here, Nada. You can introduce her to us. Yeah, uh, Nada, come here. Hurry up, hurry up. Um, yeah, she's a bit shy. Uh, yeah, this is Nada. Nada, Nada. Hi, Nada. Nada. Could you tell us how old she is and maybe if she'll... Yeah, she's 12 years old. She's in seventh grade. So I'm going to ask her, uh, do you want to ask her something or want me to ask her something about the march? She went to the march last Friday. Sure. Um, could you tell us what made you want to go to the march and what your hopes are um, to come from this march, from what will be six weeks of, of marches? <laughs> Yeah, she said that uh, because she wanted to see Palestine, she has never seen um, any part. Mm -hmm. uh, she was born 2005 and she's never seen any part of Palestine except Gaza. <laughs> so that's Ahmed, why she went to the march. Um, Ahmed, could you talk with us about um, how people are uh, coping there with all of the deaths and um, how people are feeling about it? Yeah, actually, that's um, because uh, when I went there at the protest, I wanted to write a story for why not numbers uh, uh, for uh, describing why do people um, uh, participate in the protest. And actually, that was one a question that I raised every time I interview with people. Well, personally speaking, let me say that we are not superheroes. And when death is in the scene, everyone is scared. And we do not claim that we are supermen. I've been um, in the second day, and actually when the Israelis um, uh, shot one of the participants, one of the protesters, the rest of the people around him were scared away and they were um, running away because they do not want to get killed. The Palestinians do not love death and they really love life, but they participate in this protest because they want to say that they, they value life and they want to live a normal, uh, dignified life, not, not like uh, being under... Uh, oppression with the Israelis. Um, when I interviewed people, I, uh, when I asked them, are you scared? They, um, well, actually the, the young people said they are not scared. Um, but um, when the people see that their, one of their comrades is being killed, they were really um, irritated and scared. And, but that killing the others and killing their comrades does not stop the Palestinians from uh, participating in the protest. Do they get scared? Yes. Do they, do they stop uh, protesting? No, of course not. Killing the comrades actually makes them more courageous and braver to continue the, uh, the struggle that uh, their uh, comrades uh, ha have started. 
And actually, we are the, the Palestinians, all of them, all of the people I interviewed, the young and the old, said that uh, they value life. They came here to, um, to demand their dignified life, their normal life. But uh, killing them and shooting them in the knees does not really scare them off and does not really make them stop protesting. And they all, all of them, every one of them that I asked said that they will keep participating in the protest even to the last day of the Israelis. One of the kids that I interviewed said that I'm not scared of death, I'm not scared of the Israelis because I am in my land and actually I'm writing and demanding uh, my basic right of returning to my homeland. So why would I get scared of the Israelis? They should be scared because they are occupying our lands and because they are really foreigners to this land. Um, um, yeah, that's it. So as we were sitting here on, on this webinar, I saw a headline that uh, 50,000 people are expected tomorrow. And I've also seen that um, Israel is saying that they are going to continue uh, their policy of shooting anybody that, that comes near the border. Um, Rana, could you talk to us a bit about the protests continuing um, what you expect from tomorrow and going forward, and if you and your children are, are planning to go? Well, yes, uh, for tomorrow, I think that the protests will continue. We have reached a point where, where there is no turning back. Um, we have, I mean, the, the, there's something really that's very uh, saddening and grieving about our situation is that people outside or the you know mainstream media in other countries they just um focus on like you know the stone throwers or uh us being terrorists and they uh they they don't look at the whole context of the scene i mean we have been living under siege for 11 years a complete land air and sea blockade um 45 percent poverty uh, I mean, the unemployment rate, um, electricity outages, um, no freedom of movement, no basic human rights practiced here. Um, we are deprived of the very basic um, humanitarian needs. Uh, so all of, I mean, what would you expect from all these angry people? So I think that people will continue to protest uh, peacefully. And I have actually seen uh, many of my friends um, talk about holding peaceful activities tomorrow. Um, things for children like coloring, painting. Um, some teachers, some university professors have actually um, moved their lectures to the borders and they are, they're giving their students lectures there, which is very interesting. Um, many uh, famous artists in Gaza are, are painting on tents. Uh, there is going to be uh, some, uh, many Palestinian women are cooking traditional foods now uh, at the borders like yesterday. Uh, and they're doing uh, embro embroidery and things like that. So uh, the people are, um, they're not changing their activities. They're um, sticking to being peaceful and uh, protesting uh, uh, peacefully to, you know, assert that they just want their land back. And I think that's, uh, that the protests will continue and that there, there will be a no turning back point until they achieve their goal. Our hearts are with you tomorrow and as you continue um, to protest at the border and all of your efforts. Ahmed, before we wind up this uh, webinar, if you could tell us what we in America and across the world can do to support your efforts and your struggle and help you get the results that you need. Yeah, actually, I think that there is a big part that lies on the um, shoulder of the international community because, you know, um, personally speaking, I think that most of the Palestinians participating in this uh, protest did not expect to go back to their land just after they participate in this protest. But most of them, most of the people I interviewed said that they are uh, protesting and they are doing this much because they want the world to know that there are uh, Palestinian refugees living in Gaza and that Israel is all built on a lie and that Israel is uh, built on uh, stolen, stolen lands from the Palestinians. 
So I think that uh, we really, really need the international community to raise awareness of, about our cause. And all the media that we're doing, all the seminars and webinars that we're doing here in Gaza, all the protests is all directed to the international community because we want, we want them really to know about the real cause and uh, our real uh, suffering uh, of Palestine. We really want the, the um, international community to raise awareness about our issue and um, for uh, everyone who's seeing us and watching us, we really need them to uh, share that on our social, in their social media. We want the other world who does not know anything about the people around the world who do not know anything about our cause. We want them really first to know the real problem, the real conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, it is not a clash, actually. The, what's happening in Gaza now is not a clash. It is some Israeli soldiers sniping and killing the Palestinians, uh, the uh, unarmed, the civilians, Palestinians. We want the world first to know that uh, that's the truth. And then we want really, we really want them to show that on the social media to educate the other people who do not know anything about the Palestinian cause. We need the world to be an we need the people to be ambassadors to tell the people, the other people, what's really going on on the ground. And to also to, to use social media platforms to spread the world about uh, uh, what's going on. If the international people, if the international supporters can come to Israel and come to the Gaza borders, they will see the truth for themselves. And we really need, um, so there's something personal that happened to me when uh, in the last Israeli war, I lost my brother and my brother and five of my friends, I lost them all at once. And when that happened to me, I actually was devastated. I was irritated and I was devastated more. Why? Because I felt that I'm losing something really big. I'm suffering alone, but none of the world is knowing what is going on in the uh, in Palestine. And I, I really feel that I'm not appreciated. I'm not heard and I'm silenced by the Israelis. So what we really need uh, from the international media is that to show, show us that they care about us, that they know the truth, and they are, um, they are supporting us only. Maybe social media can do it. Maybe social media and uh, sharing our stories can like, make us feel better. And personally, I would think that uh, is enough. Um, um, and really, I think that we um, should encar encourage the, uh, so the international supporters to hold different settings uh, and solidarity and raising uh, awareness campaigns because our people in the occupied territories and Jerusalem and the West Bank follow up these activities very well. So I want to thank both of you for being on with us and speaking with us and um, sharing your stories. And we are here to be ambassadors for peace as you struggle and as you go to the border uh, tomorrow and for the next six weeks. Um, for everybody who's watching, you can read about Ahmed's and Rana's writings. You can read their writings and the writings of others from Gaza uh, at, on the We Are Not Numbers website. It's wearenotnumbers.org. And you can find that as well in the comments section of uh, this Facebook Live. And um, I know that uh, Ahmed and Rana are part of a, a team of writers there. And so we want to encourage everybody to go to that site and read um, many stories from Gaza and please share them as well in your social media. Again, we wish you all the love and solidarity tomorrow. And we look forward to hearing from you both again. Thank you so much for hosting us. And I really recommend the other people to uh, visit our website, wearenotnumbers.org, and they will see lots of untold uh, human stories behind numbers in the news. Thank you so much for supporting us. And thank you so much for, holding, uh, for hosting us today.